Can we get started? So I'm Leslie John, and are we ready to start? I'm Leslie John, and uh, I'm from Harvard Business School. And I'll be talking today about how to change people's behaviors for the better. First, I want to acknowledge my wonderful collaborators on the projects I'll be presenting today. George Lowenstein from Carnegie Mellon, Kevin Volt from Penn, and also Mike Norton from HBS. Um, so the, the way, the approach that I'm going to talk about today is to get people to change their behaviors for the better, but doing so in a somewhat counterintuitive way. That is, using people's own irrationality to help them help themselves. And this approach is, we think, particularly well suited to the types of behaviors that people really want to change, but because of, say, self-control issues, they've been having difficulty actually in stating that change. And so one domain where that is really ripe for study here is health behavior change. So people want to exercise more, but come home after work and repeatedly veg out in front of the TV. Or they want to adhere to medication regimens, but fail to. Um, so I'll be talking about this idea in the context of health, but I want to keep in mind sort of the big picture that um, this approach can be applied to many other domains. And perhaps I'd be curious to hear um, if throughout this talk it, you, other ideas come to mind within your own organizations of context where this approach could be used. OK, so without further ado, health behaviors. Um, there are many <laughs> disconcerting statistics out there. Here's one on obesity. So this, this rising prevalence in obesity, not just in the United States, but beyond. Um, so in, in 1985, the, there were no states with an obesity rate of greater than 15%. Flash forward to 2005, and this is flipped. This is not a typo. There are none with fewer than 15% um, obesity rate. And obesity has a largely modifiable behavior component to it. And as do many negative health behavior patterns, in fact, um, so one study found that the proportion, um, when, when it comes to premature deaths, approximately 40% of these can be attributed to behavioral patterns, so modifiable behaviors. What's the common response to these problems? Well, from a public policy perspective, a common response is rooted deeply in standard economic theory, and it assumes a variety of things. For one, that people know what's best for themselves, which is often true. Um, the second is, I think, more tenuous, that people are able to act on that understanding. And because of these assumptions, the general um, thrust of this approach is to um, provide, is to focus on information provision as the main tool. So to inform people about the dangers of smoking. But oftentimes, the problem isn't information. It's often a lack of self-control. People engage in negative behaviors knowing full well that they're bad. People are often um, overwhelmed by information. We can't process all the information that's thrown at us all the time. Moreover, sometimes we use information. Information can have paradoxical effects. Sometimes it's used in the, for exa the exact opposite way we intend it to be used. Um, one example. So there have been several quasi-experiments recently on, that have looked at the impact of legislation that forces fast food restaurants to um, provide calorie labeling. And the idea being, if you only knew how many calories are in a Big Mac, then you wouldn't eat it. And this, um, these studies that have looked at the actual impact of labeling, they have been mixed. And um, on occasion, some have actually found evidence of like a paradoxical effect whereby um, this is a cute <laughs> illustration of this paradoxical effect that it could induce sort of this calories per dollar mindset. If you post the number of calories, you, you, oh, I want to get more bang for my buck in terms of like cal caloric density. So it could have the opposite um, consequence. Enter behavioral economics. So, in contrast to standard economics, um, behavioral economics, that is the integration of the application of psychological insights into this standard economic model, behavioral economics allows for mistakes. So it acknowledges that people's behavior can be suboptimal. Um, sometimes we behave in a way that does not maximize our long-term well-being. 
And why is this the case? This is because um, we engage in a variety, of, we, our, our errors, our decision making and judgments are systematically biased. Um, to use Dan Ariely's popular book title, we are predictably irrational. And it turns out that these biases are really deeply ingrained, so it's actually quite difficult to um, make someone not overconfident, so, and so on. The approach we take um, that I'm talking about today is to, instead of trying to de-bias people, um, in a way, re-bias people. So use people's own decision errors to help people help themselves. And so this is based loosely on a theory, an oldie but a goodie, the theory of the second best, which posits that, OK, it's best to not be biased at all. But if you're going to be biased in one way, sometimes it's, you're better served by not behaving optimally in every other respect. In other words, um, decision errors can offset or counteract each other. So let me show you an example of some work that George Lowenstein, Kevin Volpe, and I have done and, and others on how we can apply this approach to weight loss. So in a moment, I'll show you the specific biases that we leverage, so to speak. But first, just to give some concreteness to this idea, what we did was we, in different interventions, we've given people weight loss goals, say, of losing 16 pounds in 16 weeks. And then in one of these interventions, we, so people are randomly assigned to a control condition or to different financial incentive conditions that are specifically tied to different decision errors. In the lottery condition, again, I'll show you the nuts and bolts in a moment of that, but Essentially, people can earn money, um, so they're entered into a lottery, and if they, if they attain their weight loss goals, they can win money. In the deposit contract condition, people can put their own money at risk towards losing weight. So you put your money on the line, and if you don't lose weight, then you lose your money. Subjects are um, in the incentive arm, so we we tell people, so we have these weight loss goals, and we actually break it down into a daily goal of what they need to weigh. It's a simple linear function of if it's four pounds a month, four pounds divided by the number of days in the month. And so we tell people this, and every day they call in their weight, and they tell us what their weight is, and then we send them a text message saying how their self-reported weight stacked up to their goal weight that day. Um, we also, I should say, at the end of every month, people have to come into the lab. So we, 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 we keep them in check. Um, so we, they, we weigh them in on a study scale um, just to make sure they're not lying. And all right, so how do we play off of decision errors? So in this lottery incentive condition, one error, uh, decision error, is this tendency to weight probabilities in a nonlinear fashion. So for example, if you think of some event that changes your um, likelihood of death from 0% to 1% versus another event that changes it from 50% to 51%, going from 0 chance to 1%, that 1% feels like it's much stronger than if it's in the middle of the scale. So this encompasses these two propensities, overweighting of small probabilities and also this insensitivity to variations um, of probability that occur in the middle of the scale. And so what does this imply? Uh, well, for one, it suggests that providing probabilistic rewards for self-interested self behavior, in this case weight loss, will be effective. Now, a lot of the psychology, this is not just behavioral economics, so the psychology literature in general has, has suggested this as well. Specific to this intervention, we in terms of the, the overweighting of small probabilities, our lottery has includes a very small chance of winning a big prize. So the idea is you can get more bang for your buck. Um, it feels like you're more likely to win than you actually are. So you can get more bang for your buck if you administer the incentive this way relative to, say, an equal expected value payment. Sure, payment, that's not a lottery. We also use regret. Um, so strictly speaking, I don't know that this is an error. But it can be a powerfully motivating force, regret. Um, so in anticipation of regret, people want to avoid having regret. And so this can motivate people to change their behavior. So we use these things called regret lotteries, where 
we tell subjects what they would have won if they had been compliant. It's kind of cruel, but effective. <laughs> um, so in the lottery incentive condition, how does this actually work? At the beginning of the study, everyone gets a two-digit number, say 27. And every day of the study, we draw a two-digit number. Now, if the first digit matches, say 25 in this case, or the second digit matches, you win $10. And now here's the small probability. You have a very small chance. So if both digits match, if it's an exact match, you win $100. But only if you called in and were at or below your weight that day. So if it was a perfect match and you called in your weight but you were overweight, you get this text message saying you would have won $100 if you had only <laughs> lost the weight. <laughs> Now, the deposit contract condition, for its part, also used a variety of different decision errors. This notion, first, of present bias preferences. So um, this is another um, bias that encompasses two parts. One is the overweighting of immediate costs and benefits, so we're impulsive. But at the, um, at the same hand, we are we tend to take a more even-handed approach to delayed costs and benefits. So what does this imply? For one, um, simply make rewards for beneficial behavior frequent and immediate. Tightly couple it to the desirable behavior. But also to take advantage of this tendency to take an even-handed approach to delayed costs and benefits, we want people to commit to losing weight in prospect ahead of time. So people at the beginning of the month say how much, this, put their money on the line, um, they commit to losing weight in the future. Over optimism, so we're overly optimistic about our ability to exert self-control, especially when it comes to health behaviors. So um, this implies what we do is we use these deposit contracts. People are overly optimistic about their ability to lose weight, and so this um, makes them, oh sure, I can put, I'll put money down, I'll, no problem. I, I'll lose the weight. But then, after, after having, by virtue of having put the money down, loss aversion kicks in, right? This tendency for losses to loom larger than gains. And so the deposits are non-refundable. Once you put the money down, it provides this extra motivation to lose weight because you don't want to lose the money. So the way this works, at the beginning of every month of the study, um, subjects think they can put their money down towards losing weight. We have, um, so in this particular instance, we matched, we always matched the deposits. We also included a $3 fixed payment uh, because it was a bit of a hedge. We weren't sure if people would actually put their money down in practice. And um, if, so when you come in at the end of the month, if you're at or below your weight loss goal, you get the money back plus the match and the $3 day fixed payment. Now, I mentioned that we told people, we broke down their goals by, on a daily level. And so we actually gave people a little picture of this to take home. Now, one thing that we were worried about, maybe some of you have thought of it already, what if you fall off track from the beginning? So weight, losing weight is really hard. What if you, in the first month, you don't lose any weight? Then all of a sudden, in the second month, to get your payouts, you have to lose eight pounds, say which is very demotivating. We didn't want people to binge diet. But at the same time, and we didn't want people to drop out, but we also wanted to be fair to the people who were on track. So we had this um, get out of jail free card <laughs> that we gave people, whereby um, we had a fresh start trajectory. So essentially, in this case, the red line, so say this person didn't lose any weight in the first month, instead of having to make up for that in the Next month, we spread that out across the rest of the study. We use, so weight loss is the DV. We also importantly used um, an attention to tr treat approach. So especially in weight loss studies, so if you get people who drop out of the study, which is very common, and you don't properly account for this, you can overstate the effectiveness of the intervention, especially because um, you can you often get more people dropping out of the like incentive arms in this case, then in control. And the reason people drop out is very likely related, plausibly related to weight loss. Um, so it could be that all the people that are doing really badly drop out of the incentives. And if we didn't properly account for that, we'd be overstating it. So what we do is we impute anyone who dropped out of the study, we count them as having not lost any weight. We assume that the intervention was ineffective for them. 
but I should say we got very few people, very few people dropped out, only about 10%, which is quite low for weight loss studies. Before I show you weight loss, these are the net pay, so the average payment um, per person. This, the deposit contract is more because of this $3 match, um, which we've subsequently replicated without the $3 match. Here are the results. So this is the weight loss at the end of the study, four months. So this is a four-month study. And the uh, dots with the error bars are the, the group means. And then you can actually see that all the other dots are the individual data points. And so here we see that relative to control, people in these incentive conditions, they lose on average about 14 pounds. So they lose a lot more weight. And interestingly, there's no statistically significant difference between these two, the deposit contract and the lottery. Um, so this is great, but what happens when we, so three months after the end of the intervention, we followed up with people. We asked them to come back to the lab. My follow-up data do not look nearly as beautiful as Kate's. <laughs> um, so this is what happens after the incentives have been removed. Uh, so there's substantial weight regain. Now, the people in the incentive conditions, they still, they weigh less than they did at the start of the study, whereas in the control condition, um, there, there wasn't a difference in the four months, and there's still not a difference from baseline in month seven. But you can see that clearly the difference shrinks. So one of the things that we were curious about, um, we wondered whether when you remove the incentives, when, once the program is ended, we sort of set people off free, and we wondered whether we might be able to um, help people maintain the weight loss if we um, vary the way we frame this period to people. So it could be that um, maintenance, maintaining weight loss, causes people to sort of, once you finish the weight loss component, you may sort of let your guard down. Oh, it's easy. I can maintain this. So in the next study, we varied whether we, just what we called a maintenance period, whether we called it a continuation of a weight loss study or a different distinct phase. So in another study, um, this is a much longer study, so the intervention was eight months, and people received six months worth of financial incentives if they lost weight, and then the final two months they received the incentives simply for maintaining the weight, and we varied what we called this, um, we simply what the framing was. And this is, we removed this fixed payment. We got rid of the lottery for this one. So three conditions, the control, and then these two deposit contract conditions that only differ in the framing. And so we wondered whether if it's all called, the whole thing is a weight loss program, you might take the whole thing much more seriously than if the last two months are maintenance. Well, it turns out that framing did, wasn't a factor. Um, it was probably a pretty subtle thing to be looking for. But we replicate this effect of the deposit contracts. They um, foster weight loss relative to control. And then, similar to the first study, we followed up with people after we had the program had ended. And what happens? Again, people regain the weight. So to sort of take stock at the weight loss findings so far, on the one hand, so th these really point to the promise and the perils of um, what we've been trying to do so far. One is, so yes, they are very effective. This approach is effective in inducing weight loss. And it's also pretty engaging for people. So people, um, almost everyone put down, was in the deposit contract condition, was willing to make a deposit, which was encouraging. And the dropout rate was really low, and people were really engaged. They called in their weights, which are all great things. but. The really disheartening news is this weight regain, which, to be fair, is weight loss is hard. So it's common in other weight loss programs. But it, it made us really think, what, how can we administer this approach in a way that doesn't lend itself to this weight regain? One thing we've, we've been thinking about is maybe if we, if we, so we remove the incentives cold turkey. What if we wean people off? Maybe that will help them to maintain the behavior change. We also, though, this, in this study, it's very, we incentivize um, just the outcome, as in the weight loss. And we don't really give people guidance on or try to shape the behaviors that lead to weight loss. In the next 
project I'll talk about, we use a more process-oriented behavior. We're trying to get people to sort of be more fit, um, be more active, as opposed to directly incentivizing weight loss. And it also makes me, so paying people to lose weight or paying people as, as the reward is, is very handy because it's easy to administer. It's a sort of a universal um, reinforcer, but it's not without its problems. So um, there's some concern that you're sort of, you may be undermining people's intrinsic motivation, so to speak, to do these things if you impose this, this external reward. And so it really made us think about, are there other ways that we can sort of, levers we can pull to shape behavior? So moving on to the next portion of what I want to talk about is this project called, what we call Walking While Working, where we tried to get sedentary call centers, we, sedentary employees in call centers, we wanted to encourage them to use these things called walk stations, which the picture's worth a thousand wor words. I really want one of these things. Um, and so we encouraged people to use these for three hours a week for six months. And we simply varied whether the feedback we, the peer feedback we gave people on usage. So people were, everyone was, every week you got an email that simply told you about your performance, how often you, how many minutes you had spent on the walk station the preceding week. And so that's what happened in the solo condition. Other people were randomly assigned to a pair condition where you get information on your own behavior plus that of a randomly assigned coworker. And the group is your own plus that of four other people. So you use the walk station X minutes, you know, Leslie used it X minutes and so on. And, and so the email every week would summarize this. And we looked at walk station usage. We would have loved to have, we initially, when we were brainstorming with this project, we wanted to also look at um, customer service surveys. So you could think that if you're on the walk station and like looking at what does the, um, the customer think of you, maybe you're friendly or maybe it leads to better service. Um, unfortunately, we weren't, be, we weren't able to get our hands on those data, but for the future. <laughs> Um, so here's what happened. Now, this is the average minutes spent on the walk station every week for the six-month study. And first of all, there's a clear time, tr time trend. So over time, not surprisingly, usage decreases. But solo people, that is people that only get information on their own behavior, they are somewhat buffered from this decline. So the people in the pair and the group um, do worse. And so we, we looked into the data at like what, what do the data tell, us, data tell us on what's going on here. So first we looked at the group condition. This is where you get information on your own usage and that of four other randomly assigned people. And we looked first in the, in the first month of the study, we identified for every group the best performer, so the person that uses it the most, and the worst performer, the person that uses it the least. And we plotted these averages, so not surprisingly, so the best are the best and the worst are the worst of these averages. But the question is, what happens over time? And it turns out that these, the middling performers, they get dragged down to the worst performer. So once they see that someone else in their group is not using the walk stations very much, then their own behavior sort of erodes over time. The best performers are somewhat buffered from that um, that decline. Now, what happens as a control analysis, we took the solo data. These people don't get information on other people's performance. But we created artificial groups. So post hoc, we randomly assigned, we drew, randomly assigned people into groups of five with the data. And so we created these synthetic groups out of the solo data and similarly tracked over time, and it, this does not happen. When you just look at the condition and you create these artificial groups out of people who did not, in fact, get information on their peers, this dragging, being dragged down to the worst performer in the group does not occur. So it's not, it doesn't, it seems to be there's something about getting information on other people's behavior, um, bad behavior that causes you, in this case, to go down. What happens, and this is a, the parallel analysis for the pairs, so the real pairs are on top, 
Um, of course, we only have the, the better performer in the pair and the worst performer. And it's that the better performer goes down to the worst, not that the worst is brought up by the best. And this doesn't happen in the synthetic pairs. So um, these, these results are, are very intriguing to me. And they're actually consistent with some previous research showing, for one, um, there's some work on volunteering, where in this study, people came to the lab and they had they did a task during the time that they had committed to be in the lab, say an hour. And then the real study began at the end of this hour, where people could volunteer their time and stay on for another task. So they could stay as long as they wanted. And what the researchers were interested in was how long, how, what are the stopping patterns? And what they found was that as soon as someone stopped volunteering, others followed suit, which is similar to our results in the sense that as soon as someone else sort of shirks, so to speak, or doesn't use this walk station very much, then you also stop using it as much. It's also consistent with some work um, that has documented this sort of contagion property of obesity, that it seems to spread, so to speak, through social networks. And a really cool study, um, US Air Force study, showing that people that are randomly assigned to squadrons um, made up of peers who were less fit in high school, that predicts um, your failing of the, fit, the academy's fitness requirements. So being randomly assigned to people that are sort of underachievers fitness-wise, chronically, um, causes you to, has a negative impact on your own behavior. So in, in, in some ways, like the, the weight loss studies that I opened with, this raises more questions than it does answers. So this is an example of when information can have a negative impact on behavior. And what we also want to know is how can peer information get people to do the right thing? And one thing that, um, that, that could be in the context of this study that could be helpful, perhaps th there's a case to be made for when less information is more, in the sense that what if we plucked the most in the group, if we only gave people the information on the best performer every week in their group? maybe that would mitigate um, the negative effect of seeing everybody. Um, so in conclusion, I've talked about this approach of um, using people's decision errors, biases, irrationality to help them help themselves. And I've talked about first the using financial incentives and then also looking at newer ways using social feedback, how that, what is the effect of social feedback on people's behavior. To underscore what types of behaviors does this approach work well for, or what is it suited for, that is, the types of things that people want to change, but they've really been having difficulty accomplishing. And the, sort of the beauty of, of this point, I think, is that we're not strong-arming people into doing things that we think they should do. These are things that people want to change. They're willing to impose constraints on, the, the, on their own behavior. They sort of opt into. Um, so I'm, as behavioral economics is sort of en vogue, uh, and I see more and more, I see um, companies doing things that are clearly inspired by behavioral economics popping up. And um, so the, the spirit of, of of changing people's behavior using this approach is there, but oftentimes I'll see examples and they're just not quite there. Um, so the devil's often in the details in how these things are implemented. As an example, so my health insurance program, they have a, a fitness benefit where if you use a gym, if you're a gym member for four months in the previous year, then you're eligible for a $150 benefit. So the spirit of it is great. <laughs> But the implementation um, could be improved, shall I say. So what are some flaws? So this isn't a totally behaviorally informed implementation, right? So it rewards once a year. Well, we, we know that feedback is more, rewards are more beneficial when they're tightly coupled to the behavior. Um, in addition, it's a really labor-intensive claim process. So you have to keep your receipt from at least four months ago when you signed up 
probably longer. And then you have to, we have to remember to do this. And then you have to fill in a form that has quite a bit of information you have to fill out. And then you have to mail it in. So this is totally incompatible with people's, you know, the great inertia that people face in trying to do these things. Um, and and I, would, I would argue that you could actually um, pay people a lot less. The benefit could be a lot less if it was implemented in a different way. And as I noted at the beginning, so health behavior change is just one area that this approach can be beneficial for. But some other promising domains, climate change. Um, so this is a doozy. And I, I, you know, I don't think that behavioral economics can solve climate change. Uh, there's definitely something to be said for the sort of standard economic approach. If, you, if, you, if gas is expensive enough, then people will change their behavior. But as I hope that I've shown, the way that you implement this can have a big difference. Um, and if you use insights from, from what we know about people's decision errors. One tidbit here on public transportation use to, as an example, you could think of, so our lottery incentive scheme, you could think of something similar with public transportation. Like there's a lottery every day, there's a lottery, and if you, if you have swiped your metro pass on the subway, then you're eligible to win. So, there's tons of, of, there are lots of decision errors and biases out there just waiting to be exploited for good. Um, saving. So Frank, at the beginning of today, referred to this program by Thaler and Bernardi. It's called Saving More Tomorrow that really capitalizes on these notorious resolutions people make to save more tomorrow. But then when tomorrow comes, they never save. So in this program, um, they get people to commit to saving money in the future. And that's a lot easier to, to do than to commit to saving money now. But then when the future rolls along, people have sort of already locked themselves in, and their inertia takes over, and they don't opt out of that commitment they made. And this has huge effects on getting people to save, to save more money. Charitable giving. So you could think of how some of the things I've talked about today could be applied to either like a call center scenario the on the requester side or on the donor side. And there are likely to be many others. I think with that, I will say thank you. And I'd love to hear thoughts you have on this or questions. So let's open it up. In your obesity study, did you look at suppressing the uh, section of the pie chart or the information you gave about genetic predisposition? Because it seems to me that that's a big reason people give both negatively and positively about weight loss that my genetics are my destiny and so I'm protected whether or not I'm overweight or I'm going to die of a heart attack whether or not I'm overweight because they point to that section of the pie chart saying your genetic predisposition to heart disease is a significant factor. So people, are you suggesting that people sort of use that to like rationalize or well it's hopeless because I'm... I can't change my behavior because I'm genetically predisposed. Or the opposite. I'm pretty well protected, so it doesn't really matter ah, if to I'm... To feel uh, sort of invulnerable. Right. right. Um, yeah, that's an interesting idea. So are you, so you're saying that you, you might be able to play around with the extent to which, so if you tell people that, um, like, you could sort of, um, a preventative measure to people would be to highlight your behavior, you know, you can't rest on your laurels um, and your genetic predisposition if it's, in fact, to be thinner. And you could also, to people that may be overweight, you can say, no, you can really, 40% of, you know, you can change. Yeah, that's a really interesting idea. And more broadly, um, the way you can present information in a way that really helps people to change behavior. And I think, to come back to Kate's talk, that's another example of, you know, the way the message matters and the match of the message, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about whether you think the incentive that you offer might make a difference. So for example, with weight loss, if you offer people a professional picture of themselves at eight, 18 pounds lighter or whatever, mm -hmm. yeah. new pair of pants or something that would you know, suggest that maintaining yeah. a weight loss is better. Yeah, that's a really great idea. Um, so as I mentioned, like the paying people is sort of, it's an easy way um, to incentivize. I would love to try more sort of hedonic rewards or more 
Um, you could think they, the reward in and of itself could be used to supercharge behavior. So like, what if the rewards were like gift certificates to healthy stores, or you could only buy fruit and vegetables with this, if, that the, if that's the reward. So you could, there's lots more that we could do, I think, to, to change sort of, use the rewards that are in a, in a more reinforcing way, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there data to support, uh, you talked, it seems like the communicability of bad habits is you, you talked, there's a lot of data to support that. Is there equal data to support the communicability of good habits, or are our friends just bad things as well? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, in the, the behaviors that I've been looking at, sort of the easier thing to do, I would argue, is to not exercise. The easier thing to do is to not eat healthy in many ways, especially given that like the availability of junk food. Um, so for the types of behaviors where sort of the dominant response is to be unhealthy, I think that peers can have um, exert like this negative influence. But it would be interesting to see when you can flip that. And, I, and I'm not, off the top of my head, I, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> yes? So for charitable giving, I think you're saying for savings and charitable giving that I would have to make a commitment that's um, that somehow I can't get out of, like I sign a pledge form that's a legal document to give next year. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so I think that would be very effective. Um, and in fact, charitable organizations often, um, I mean, this is just anecdotally, what I see is they're, they're trying to push the like small amount but recurring stream of payments than one big single gift. And I think part of that is based on this idea that, you know, it's like a, it's a habit, it's a status quo. Um, but I think that if you, you have to be sort of delicate in how you implement this because if you have to sign a legal document that you're going to do this, then people are just going to, it could um, foster reactants in people. Um, so the nice thing, for example, the Save More Tomorrow program, you can change your savings rates at any time. Um, but you don't because of default. So people still have to have the freedom to change. But yeah, I think, does that get at your question? Yeah, I think actually pledges, I mean, you can explain to a donor that the, that the organization needs to rely on their promise. Mm -hmm. So the, the pledge yeah. form is an, an additional gift in addition to it. Yeah, yeah, I like that. That makes sense. I feel like I'm ignoring the side of the room. <laughs> yes. Oh, thank you. Um, so in the, on the walk station thing, you had high walkers and medium walkers and low walkers, and it looked like the high walkers were going to walk a lot anyway. And the people who didn't walk very much were lazy regardless of what happened. And it was the people in the middle who were kind of vulnerable depending on what kind of network they were attached to, whether or not they had the adverse information about their coworkers who weren't walking very much. Is there a way of predicting ahead of time who's vulnerable to that? So, um, yeah, I mean, certainly you can look at, I haven't done this, but you could look at, we have, you could look at sort of health assessments in this company and see what predicts. Um, you could certainly do that. One of the interesting things with this sinking down to the lowest performer is that, so there was heterogeneity in the groups, like some groups are better than other groups. So even when you had like, um, so some of the, the people that are best in each group, they're not actually stars in the grand scheme of things. They're just the best person in that group. So it's like a very micro phenomenon that we see occurring, unfolding over time. Um, yes? Is there variability? Did, did at some point during the exercise one person take the lead and then somebody else? Or was it like static? One person got out to an early lead and then they just stayed there the whole time? Uh, it was, so... In general, it was, yeah, the front runner, the, the, it, it stayed over time. And so the, if you look at like different, different um, if you operationalize best performer in different ways, so if you look at who's the best in the first week, or like it's, it's, the, it's the same um, pattern, yeah. The first financial incentive study reminds me a lot of conditional cash transfers, whose success is highly dependent on the ratio of the incentive to someone's income. So what was the average income of the participants in that study? So it was, we ran those studies in a fairly low income population. I think the median um, 
household income was 30,000. And so, yeah, one might wonder um, sort of the like diminishing marginal utility of wealth, whether this would be, what is the effectiveness of this type of intervention in a more affluent subpopulation? If you did a typical incentive scheme where if you reach this goal, we'll give you this incentive. Because then people who are resource constrained mm -hmm. and want to make that change now have resources to do that. Ah, I see. Yeah. Yeah, possibly. Yes. Catherine. Hi. Uh, on charitable giving, I'd like to know a little bit more, um, and particularly on the groups, whether uh, you have any thoughts about whether my intuition would be if people know each other in a group that that would have influence versus those who would be might be put together who don't know each other. Uh, so if you had a situation where you are um, instead of it being exercise you're told you're you're told how much other people are donating is that what you're saying? Yeah, or even friends um, pressuring you. Yeah, so here we um, Yes, we randomly assigned people because we wanted to look at sort of the pure impact of feedback. But actually, that might be something you could manipulate is whether people get to choose their own groups or not. If it's randomly assigned versus chosen, um, there could be, you could see differences there. Yeah. Uh, gentlemen, OK. Final question. Uh, sure. So I'm, I'm really interested in how social feedback can influence behavior. So I really love to study. <laughs> um, I, uh, and I was curious, do you have any longitudinal data uh, past the, the few data points? And did you see anyone actually, so the trends seem to be decreasing. Um, did you see anyone increase their walking behaviors? And why? Uh, why or uh, why not? Yeah. Yes, so these are just averages. Um, certainly there's some variation, but there is not, I mean, systematically, no. Um, but that said, I am very interested in social feedback, and I think that um, new technologies can really be harnessed to sort of leverage the power of social networks. And there's lots of um, studies that I would love to run using social network type apps. Um, and actually, I just had one other thought, and then I'll leave. Um, coming back to Devin, um, that I, I just remembered where you were talking about how you could, um, like presenting someone with, um, maybe it would be motivating to show someone a picture of them, like sort of a lighter self. And um, last year, my brother showed me this app that he had found where it's the opposite of that on a cell phone, where you take a picture of yourself, and then it makes you fat. And like my reaction to this was just so visceral. And it would be cool to test, like, when and why is it more motivating to have the fat picture or the ideal. And moreover, you could think of something where you implement something like that in a social networking site. Like you get people to say pre-commit to, if I don't lose weight, this picture is going to be posted. <laughs> Versus, so there's tons of stuff you could do. Anyways, thank you very much. Bye.